Yeah. Good, I'm ready. Look at that. It's only like two after. I'm early, right? And uh, Good. Well, I'm glad you're here tonight. It's good to see you. And uh, almost doesn't feel like it's church time yet. It's still not dark out. And uh, I was thinking today on the way back from the house, I said, it's this is the first Wednesday night. We're coming in in pure daylight, and it's maybe a little still uh, by the time we finish in just a little bit. And so, but anyway, glad you're here. Let's grab our songbooks together tonight. Turn to hymn number 395. Number 395. This is not one of those songs you can sing with a frown. I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis a melody of love. In my heart there rings a melody. Let's stand together if we can and sing out hymn 395. I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis a melody. singing it sounded good sounds like everybody's at least awake to start the service tonight that's a good thing that's for sure let's pray together ask the lord to meet with us tonight brother john forney lift your voice there lead us in a word of prayer Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Grab your prayer bulletin. I do not have one. I got all the way here uh, without one tonight, so if you don't mind to fetch me one up here, I appreciate that in your life. Thank you very much. Anyone else need a prayer bulletin tonight? A couple other folks do. Good. Very good. Today is March the 13th. Is there something special about today? Somebody, today's somebody's birthday. It's here. I'm trying to ring a bell. There's somebody's anniversary. There's something. Oh, well. Maybe not. And uh, lots of things to be praying for, lots of things up and coming. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll forget by the end of the service if I don't remember, if I don't say something now. Um, pray for Brother Ron. He called me earlier today, and while at work, sounded like while near the end of his day, he had picked up a piece of equipment, 70 or 80-pound piece of equipment, to move it for a customer that picked it up and took a couple steps and tripped over the um, the forks on the forklift he had been driving, and so hands full ended up going almost face first into the concrete, and uh, so he's uh, he called me an hour later when he was on his way home. I said, "Are you driving?" He said, "Yes." I said, "Are you driving on the right side of the road?" 
And uh, he said, I think so, but he said, man, I am so gut bad. And uh, said he had, thought he had some scratches on his face and elbow and leg and knee and ankle and, and uh, all those kind of things. And uh, had a, if you know what a single shear plow is, that's what he was moving. And uh, he said, I fell on it trying to brace myself to keep from hitting concrete and ended up hitting the side of his face on the concrete. And so he's all stoked up, called me earlier, and uh, he said, man, if I can get up and walk and be there, I'll be there. If not, that's, that's what's going on. And so pray for him tonight. Pray nothing's majorly wrong. And he's at home best I know. He ain't going to the hospital yet, did he? He's at home. Okay. And so uh, let's be sure to be praying for him. Pray for his wife. She decided to go home and take care of him. She needs more prayer than he does probably. And uh, so be praying for Miss Anne as well. And I knew if I didn't mention that right off uh, the bat, I just thought that I would forget him, but I just didn't want to forget uh, letting everybody know to be praying for him. Some other prayer requests we'll share uh, in just a little bit, and we've been praying for some variety of things, and we'll talk about some of those in our prayer request time. But as far as some upcoming events go, tomorrow evening, Lancaster School of the Bible, 7 o'clock, and uh, all three classes tomorrow night, we're over halfway through this spring session, so excited about that. We do have a work day this Saturday, 8 a.m., and there's some things we're going to be doing inside and uh, maybe some things, depending on the weather, we can get to outside, uh, but lots of inside work to be working on uh, between now and then, and especially on Saturday. There is a visitation over at the Primrose Retirement Community at 1045, and then church service there as well on Sunday at 2 o'clock. There will be visitation uh, meeting at 10 o'clock. We'll go out and do some visiting on Saturday at 10 a.m. as well. And so folks that are here working at 8 o'clock, we're going to let you keep working. And uh, several of us will meet at 10 o'clock and gear up and head out and do some visiting. And so that's what's coming up just the rest of this week. Lots of things up and coming this week, that is for sure. And so tomorrow, be praying for a bunch of college kids. A lot of college kids from Crown College uh, there in Tennessee are heading to just a variety of places to go out and minister and serve for the weekend. And there's three young men headed this direction and uh, looking forward to having them. They'll be coming in tomorrow. They just messaged me earlier today and they'll be here about four o'clock tomorrow evening. They're excited about being here Friday and Saturday and we're putting them to work on Sunday for sure. And uh, so they're looking very much forward to that. And uh, pray for Abby. She'll be traveling this weekend as well and uh, ministering in a church that she's familiar with. And uh, so be praying for her and her friend and all they've got going on this weekend as well. Pray for them and their safety as they travel. And uh, I know they'd greatly appreciate that. And uh, Mindy and I have been trying to message, message Abby a little bit in the last couple weeks. And uh, let her know we'd like to see her, but we're appreciative of the fact that She's going to serve and be a blessing in a church, and that's a good thing. And just trying to encourage her along while she's there uh, working and serving, getting her education and uh, preparing for what God has for what's next. So let's keep praying for these college kids, do our best to encourage them, uh, especially the next few days, some of these young men that will be here uh, while they're progressing toward their time of serving God with the rest of their life, right? And so but be sure to introduce yourself and encourage them right along. Two weeks from Sunday is Easter Sunday, and so lots of things going on that day. Uh, this Sunday, we'll have a sign-up sheet available if you'd like to help bring in breakfast on, on Easter Sunday morning. We'll have a sunrise service at 7, and uh, that service uh, probably about, about an hour, and so we'll have breakfast together right about 8.15 or so, and uh, that way all of us have time to have a little bit of breakfast before we head out on van route and that kind of thing. And so if you'd like to help with breakfast, there'll be a sign-up sheet uh, for that this Sunday available uh, for things you can volunteer to help bring in. And so we appreciate the, hap that, the, the help. That's an enjoyable time. That's one of my favorite things. We just last year uh, really had a great service here on Sunrise Sunday, uh, Sunrise service last year, and I'm looking forward to that again this year. And uh, there have been times in the past we had held that early service, other times we hadn't. And uh, so I'm grateful we did that last year. I'm looking forward to do it again on this year. So, all right, fellas, if we can, let's go ahead and prepare for the offering tonight. I don't have a new update letter uh, for this week for many of our missionaries. It's been a quiet week as far as that goes. I've been reading a couple at a time, but I do want to mention to you, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of our missionary families to be praying for. And, fellas, I won't make you stand long. Um, keep praying for the Gills, Dan and Kelly Gill. They have moved uh, to Michigan. Just continue to pray for them. Uh, just in some transitional things, new house, new church. 
Um, same ministry, just launching out from a different place there in Michigan. But pray for them while they readjust, while they resettle uh, there in Michigan. Also, continue to pray for Luke and Jessica Marie. Luke and Jessica Marie, um, they are still in Bolivia, and but headed home uh, for on furlough uh, soon in the next few weeks. And so pray for them. They don't come home that often, and uh, they haven't been in this part of the country here in over eight years. And uh, so he had been home a few times with medical needs for his dad, uh, just in some quick trips back and forth. And so they're going to be leaving the ministry they've worked hard at there for the last eight years or so. And uh, just pray for them as they make preparation for the church to be able to sustain while they're away and for their travel plans and all those kind of things. Just keep those folks in your prayers. Well, let's pray together tonight. Well, Lord, we thank you again for your goodness to us. God, we thank you for your mercy in each of our lives. God, we thank you for the guilds tonight as they have uh, relocated from Milford there in the Cincinnati area. Lord, this uh, beginning of the first of this year, and they've resettled now in Michigan and launching out of a church and the same ministry, but new location there in, in, in Michigan. Lord, I pray you'd help them as they settle. Lord, as they're getting used to being a little further from their children and their families and Lord, I just pray you'd help them. Lord, help them to find Michigan to be a home with them. And Lord, I pray you'd keep them safe as they travel out weekends and, and throughout the week to help lead churches and scripture assembly to send in different various places around the world. Lord, I pray you'd help them settle into this new location. Lord, you just guide them, Lord, to the places they need to be serving throughout that state, northern Ohio and Indiana, uh, Lord, throughout this year. Lord, I think of the Marines, Luke and Jessica and Lord, just some uh, some things coming up that they're not used to traveling as a family and then to come back to the States for a few months. And Lord, I pray you would settle their hearts. I pray that the right people and the right schedule and events and things would all fall into place for them to be comfortable leaving behind what you've uh, led them to do while they've been there in Bolivia. And Lord, I pray uh, that the work they have been involved in would continue and that it would thrive even in their absence. And Lord, we just think of them coming home this summer and and uh, Lord, their eldest daughter headed off to college this fall and leaving her here when they do head back. And Lord, we just pray you'd help them at this stage of their life and this stage of their ministry. And Lord, we pray you'd give them comfort, pray you give them guidance. And Lord, we just pray that you would continue to meet their every need. Lord, I thank you for your blessings in our church. I thank you for, uh, Lord, meeting needs that are present week by week. And Lord, I just thank you for good things that are happening. And Lord, we thank you for challenges as they come. And Lord, how they're helping us to look to thee. Lord, and to trust Thee, and Lord, that our faith is increasing, Lord, help it to continue to increase in Thee, and Lord, I pray you meet with us tonight, and we pray you bless the offering now, Lord, help us to be faithful in the matter of giving to missions, Lord, I pray that what's given tonight would be able to financially keep missionaries in parts of the world where the gospel is now being preached, Lord, so they can faithfully serve you there, Lord, we pray again your hand of blessing on this meeting, we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Heidi. I appreciate that very much. Let's take our Bibles tonight, please. 
and turn to the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter number 5, 1 John chapter number 5. Sorry, I was just making a couple notes, make sure I don't forget things for later. Did your mom have surgery already? Okay. I knew that. I was making sure. Was that last week, Trey? Or two weeks ago, or at some point in history? Yeah, it's been that kind of week. It's been good. It's been busy. And uh, lots and lots of things going on this week. And uh, I'm grateful to get to church tonight, that's for sure. There are some weeks when it feels like the time span from Sunday to Wednesday is like a snap of a finger. And Wednesday is here. There are other weeks, like this week, that feel like it's been three weeks since I've seen you, since we've been here, and so just lots of activity, lots of things going on, and uh, so grateful for that, good things, but to just a lot happening. Tonight we're going to continue to study uh, some biblical numbers. Um, I am not, I was just explaining something to Brother Nathan Moreland just before church tonight, I said, listen, if you took every number of the Bible and studied it out individually, we'd be here for years studying biblical numbers. That's not what we're going to do. And uh, so far, we looked at the number one, the number two. Um, tonight, we're going to be looking at the number three. And uh, I, I, there are folks that take these thoughts to the extreme. I want you to know that. And um, there, there's, I've done a bunch of research about Bible numbers over the last several months and uh, there's one fellow in particular that I have found his research just about biblical numbers. And it's, I, I borrow some of his notes just to help me look at different passages of Scripture to build some things on for what I'm giving to you. And uh, it's intense. And I, he's got a couple hundred different numbers. And uh, I was teasing with Nathan. Nathan's trying to help me uh, let folks know, putting out some Instagram posts, those kind of things about what I'm going to be speaking about. And, Tonight, I said, you put something out. He goes, yeah, I already knew tonight's message title. I knew that one was coming. I said, well, I'm skipping three and four and going straight to five. And he goes, are you for real? And uh, no, we're, we're, I said, we're staying on three. I said, but don't, don't assume that moving forward. And uh, one and two and three. And uh, listen, honestly, you could take every number that you could ever calculate and find a reason to talk about it. And um, we're not going to do that. We're going to move from here. Um, we may. I'm still looking through some information about the numbers 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and see where we go from here. How many of you right now, there are some biblical numbers you've seen used repetitively that you're looking forward to hearing about? Good. What are some of those? 7. That's, that's a pretty popular one. Yeah. Somebody say anything other than Did you say 12? That's what I thought. 12. And uh, that, that's an interesting one to me. And uh, I've, I've been studying that with some already. I'm looking forward to that one. Um, the number 40, some of, some of the things like that. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to those. And uh, so we'll get those. I, I don't want these thoughts and things to be laborious. Um, I hopefully uh, they are things that are helpful. I don't know if you've noticed over the last couple of weeks, I, I, I've done something to help me get in started in my study. The fact of the matter is, I, I, it's printed out here for me somewhere. There it is. The number three, according to these notes, appears 467 times in God's Word. 467 times in God's Word. What I have learned for myself is that it's hard just to look at something like a Strong's Concordance and just count those references because the word three, T-H-R-E-E, -E, may be in the Word of God, but the very next word might be hundred or score. And it's not really referencing just the number three. It's referencing the number 300, which is an interesting number itself uh, in the Word of God. And, and it's not just three score. Three score, of course, is how many years? 60. And so it, it's trying to identify those. Those are not, I didn't sit and count every reference and find 467. I'm trusting someone else's research on that. And uh, if you'd like to prove them wrong, good luck. Go for it and uh, read through, mark them as you go. The number three, the, the quickest summation tonight, I really tonight 
could probably just read this one sentence and we could pray together and go home. It wouldn't be very nice. It wouldn't help you much. But the number three conveys the meaning of completeness. The meaning of completeness, though to a lesser degree than the number seven. That's interesting. For example, in the book of Revelation, the number seven is the most used number in the book of Revelation. The second most used number in Revelation is the number three. There are a lot of threes throughout the Bible. If we look through them, we could talk about some things uh, going on historically. The first time in the scripture that the number three is used is in Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 10. I'll read that to you just in a second. I'm almost there. Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 10. And Noah begat three sons. Three sons is the first time we find that. And before that, there were 300. When you go through the genealogies in chapter 5, for example, verse 22 of chapter 5, And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. But the first time the individual number of numerically the number three is given to us in Scripture, it's referencing Noah's three sons. In other words, the, the, the completeness of what Noah needed to be able to build an ark with help and to be able to inhabit the ark and move forward. And those eight total individuals would continue on through the ark to continue the human race. His three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. The last time the number three is used in Scripture is, of course, in the book of Revelation. And it's in a, it's in a very unique place in chapter number 21 and verse number 13. And on the east, three gates. And on the north, three gates. And on the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. Now, if you counted the sides, north, south, east, and west, that's how many sides? Well, it's a total of four sides. Yeah, you're, you're a step ahead of me. Let's go back. we got the whole process here. <laughs> right. And those four sides with three gates per side equals bingo. And so back to that great number, number 12. And so she was just, you would have not passed class, math class. You, you skipped the steps. And you went straight to the answer. And uh, I used to get in trouble in math class for just giving them the answer and not showing the steps. And, uh, but no, three gates per side, three on this side, three on this side, three on this side, three on that side. And if you remember when I was teaching about the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle and the measurements, if you remember how many tribes of Israel were there? Twelve. And how many of those tribes camped in each direction? Three. One, three to the north, three to the south, three to the east, three to the west, three. This completeness, this union, this gathering. They didn't just camp in a big circle. It was three together, three together, three together, three together. Now, if I were to talk about the appearances of the number three, here's some interesting thoughts. Jesus, oh, let's get back before that. There were three righteous patriarchs before the flood, Abel, Enoch, and Noah. They were declared to be righteous. After the flood, there were three righteous fathers, Often you'd hear these words, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those three listed in a trilogy. And uh, it's interesting to me when you'd, when you'd hear those listed, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I often have wondered why that next statement didn't go on to say the God of Joseph. It doesn't give us that. It's often listed as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that completeness of lineage that started with those three fathers. There's many appearances of the number three. Jesus only took three of his disciples with him up to the Mount of Transfiguration. They were, yes, Peter and James and John. I have them listed as James and Peter and John, but that's acceptable, right? And what they saw in a vision was three people, three people in their glorified form, Jesus and Moses and Elijah. Very good. Um, you can go on to say, and this is interesting, there were three people in Scripture that were allowed to ask God anything. Solomon, Ahaz, and then, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, here's another interesting thought. The Bible only mentions the names of three angels. 
interesting, right? Um, there's another thought here. I'm trying to find this really quickly. I got a ton of notes and I don't need them all. Uh, that is for sure. Um, there it is. Jesus prayed three times in the Garden of Gethsemane before his arrest. He was placed on the cross about the third hour of the day. He died about the ninth hour. There was three hours of light as he hung on the cross. There were three hours of darkness as he hung on the cross, covering uh, the land while Jesus was suffering on the cross from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. Jesus was dead and buried for three days. It's, it's repetitive. It's three, it's three, it's three. It's an idea of completeness. Now, that doesn't mean that every time you see the number three in Scripture, there, there's a, a, a great wealthy, rich, or deeper meaning of, I, I've got to search this for days and weeks and hours. I'm not saying don't search the Scriptures, but that idea of, you ever wondered why, why are there three listed here? I've wondered, honestly, oftentimes, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, why not, why not go another generation why not go two more generations why not give us a little further understanding of this lineage and what god is doing it's because he gave us just those three abraham isaac and jacob when jesus was crucified on the cross how many crosses do we know were lifted up there we know three we know those three i have found tonight and a thought that i want to share with you is in first john chapter five and I'm trying, I hope you've noticed already, I'm trying not to just give you facts, I'm trying not to just give you statements, but something that we can apply to our lives, something hopefully to encourage you as we're looking into these numbers. Oh yeah, here's some other things about coming up in Revelation, lots of them. In 1 John chapter 5, I want you to look at verse number 13. I'm going to start at the beginning of the chapter in a moment, but I'm going to start first by reading verse number 13. This is a verse of scripture that I have read, I have quoted, I, I've given to folks before. Listen to chapter 5 of 1 John, chapter, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. I had somebody teach me a long time ago that that is a great verse to give folks in regards to the assurance of their, their salvation. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. What things? These things that I written unto you. Let's go back and start at the first of the chapter and see something special that God gives us tonight involving the number three. Verse number one says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. By the way, that's an important verse to remember. What God gives us to do in living for him, in abstaining from sinful things, and in walking in righteous things, those are not grievous things. In other words, those aren't such a heavy burden that we cannot do it. Those aren't grievous things. Verse number four. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Now listen to this verse. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 
I was not there to see it. I was not there to witness it, but I was told by a pastor that I heard preach when I was just a small child. I remember this very distinctly, though. He said that he had been in a church service in, in, a, in a revival type meeting, an evangelistic outreach type meeting, actually, and he had preached a salvation message. And when it came time for the invitation, here's what he said. The preacher said, I, I want everyone to stand and let's turn to this invitation hymn and let's sing this hymn together. And I want you to hear what the word of God says while we sing. And while folks sang an invitation song, that preacher just stood at the podium and quoted 1 John chapter 5, verse number 12, over and over and over. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. He that hath the Son of God hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And this preacher that was preaching about it said he was just there as a guest to hear this gentleman preach, and he said this fellow just kept repeating that statement, probably that verse 20, 25, 30, 35 times. And he said the first 10 or 12 times he quoted it, it was just solemn in, in, in the building. But then, then he said it wasn't very long when somebody stepped out of the aisle and came forward to get saved. And then another, and then another, and then another, and then another. And, and, and dozens of people got saved that night because they were hearing the word of God. And the word of God says was saying to them and says to us, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And as he quoted that over and over and over, folks were responding to God's word. And obviously, as I read through that text tonight, that's probably not the verse that stuck out most with you. But most likely, in 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, you saw the repetition of two uses in verse 7 and two uses in verse 8 of the number 3. 3 again, meaning completeness. If we begin in chapter 5, verse 13, verse 13, these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, the Son of God, that you may know, that you may know that you have eternal life. Listen, I want to try and take just a few minutes and, and show you tonight from this text the completeness of our eternal life in Christ. This is what God is saying. Let's work our way backwards. Verse 9 says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. In other words, if we believe what we can see, if we believe what we've been told by other men. You ever had somebody tell you something that just sounded unbelievable, but through witnesses, maybe three <laughs> Three people standing together testifying to the same thing. You're, you're finally convinced that something is true. The Bible says in this verse, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. And this is all about understanding that Jesus Christ came to this earth, that he bled and died for our sins, that he is the Son of God. And if we receive him, we may have eternal life. Here's the witness of men. Verse number 8. For there are three that bear witness in earth. Three that bear witness in earth. The Spirit. The Spirit. Obviously, that's a capital S on that word. That's not just referencing an emotion. That's not just referencing um, an evil spirit. That's not just referencing uh, anything else. That's referencing the Holy Spirit. The actions of the Holy Spirit in this world. Now I want you to notice the order of what it's saying here. The spirit and the water and the blood. Listen, I, I, without getting too specific about it tonight biologically, but it's the Holy Spirit of God that put the seed of Jesus Christ in the womb of Mary. The Bible uses the word the spirit overshadowed her. Listen, the work that the Holy Spirit did in, in, in putting the seed in Mary's womb for there to be God enrobed in flesh. The fact that Jesus was born of a virgin is witness of men that Jesus is the Son of God. That Mary could testify, that Joseph could testify, that, that God and, and Gabriel and angels could testify, and, and that prophets of the Old Testament could say, for a virgin shall conceive. 
And the fact that the Holy Spirit did this great work of overshadowing Mary and providing Jesus Christ the proper place for there to be a robe of flesh developed for him to inhabit for 33 and a half years and walk among us for that time. This work of the Spirit is an evidence that's been seen of men. The second thing that it mentions, these three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit and the water. The water. Most believe this is referencing the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you remember, the baptism of Jesus by John in the Jordan River is really one of the marks of the beginning days of the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, John baptizing Jesus is a great reminder to us also that we don't get baptized to have our sins washed away. We don't get baptized in a river so our sins go downstream instead of filling a big, bloody, uh, sinful pool. Somebody told me once, I'll never forget it, no way I'd get baptized inside in a baptistry. You know how much sin would be in that tank by the time I got to it? Right. To which I relayed to them, no, 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 they sell sin-killing chlorine at the Bible bookstore. And they said, oh, I didn't know that. I think my next statement was, did you also know they decided to take the word gullible out of the dictionary? Right. No. Water does not wash our sins away. Did Jesus have to get baptized? No. The reason Jesus was baptized of John was, number one, he was identifying himself with John's ministry and with the truth that John was preaching. Jesus being baptized by water, if you remember the event when that took place, the Bible lets us know that as he was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove, and they heard a voice from heaven that said, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Can you imagine standing on the banks of the Jordan River, watching John the Baptist, and all of a sudden, this carpenter's son that's now 30 years old comes walking on the scene, and John, who you've been following as a disciple, says, Folks, here he is. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And as his face clears the, 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 the face of that water, a, a dove descending and appearing of a dove, and a voice from heaven that could have shaken the foundations of all the earth, says, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. Well, so what God is saying is, men have lived and witnessed with their eyes these evidences. There are those that could personally testify that Jesus was born of a virgin. There are those that could specifically testify that he was baptized and the presence of God was upon him. And the Bible goes on to say, in the water and the blood. The Bible lets us know distinctly and specifically of the story of the crucifixion of Christ. And it wasn't what killed him, we know that. But while he was yet hanging on the cross, a spear was thrust into his side. And came forth from his side both water and blood. When Jesus was crucified, he was not crucified in a public place. Now, if you can, it's not easy to do this, but if you can, mentally rewind a couple thousand years. Can you imagine being one of the original recipients of this letter? Maybe being one of those that's still living and breathing to hear these words, excuse me, to hear the words spoken. And that the witness on earth, yeah, they could have choked that back then too. Listen, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of exciting things here I'm trying to relay to you. It's a challenge. I'd like to say there's a whole lot up here trying to get out of a little filter, but you probably think it's the opposite. There's a, a great big opening here with very little trying to find its way through the gaps, right? But rewind about 2,000 years and imagine sitting down and hearing a letter read that says, there are three to bear witness in the earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. 
And it's very likely that some of the people that heard this letter read had seen the blood pour forth from the Lord Jesus' body. That could have spoken and said, I saw that. I saw that he died. It's very possible there were those hearing this that said and, and, and remembered that he died. That he gave his life. Now listen to what the Bible goes on to say. Verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, if we're willing to believe what men have seen with their own eyes and what they have reported to us, the witness of God is greater. Or for the sake of studying the number three, you could say the witness of God is complete. It's thorough. So what's the witness of God? Verse number seven. As we continue to go back to build on what's taking place here, for there are three that bear record in heaven. How many of you have seen inside the walls of heaven? I haven't either. Neither have I. My eyes are not able to see there yet. There are three that bear record in heaven. Now there are things that human eyes have seen and there are things human eyes have not seen. In the Bible, in verse number 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, that's of course referencing our Father God in heaven, the Word. I hope by now you've already noticed that word Word is not a lowercase w, that's an uppercase w, that's referencing none other than Jesus Christ himself. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. In the Bible in verse number 8. Let's go back to verse 8. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. Listen to this. And these three agree in one. Complete agreement that Jesus Christ is our sacrifice. He's our Savior. The Bible says in verse 7, it does not say these three agree in one. It says the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. These three are one. Listen, the number three when we read it, and especially in texts like this, I hope when we get to this, what I'm hoping to do tonight is to take this very powerful, very important verse of 1 John chapter 5, thir verse 13, and give some more completeness and some more excitement to this verse because of the complete knowledge of what God has done. Caleb, can you come here a minute, please? I want you to help me with something. Good. <laughs> you popping like an old man. Yeah. Many of you have seen this before. Maybe some of you have not. What do we call the first 39 books of the Bible? Those are the Old Testament. Testament. You could also refer to that as the Old Covenant. If you talk about covenants in the Bible, most often when there were land transactions and covenants or, and contracts, a word from today, were used, most often those covenants were entered into with a binding agreement and they would build an altar and make a sacrifice and they would join hands, the buyer and the seller, right hands and left hands, and they would walk. Can you walk? Sign there. And they would walk over the altar of sacrifice where that sacrifice was burning. How many know what happens when you get close to a fire? Number one, you get warm. Number two, you walk away. You walk away smelling like smoke. Right? You ever been near a fire and not walk away smelling like smoke? Yeah. Right? They would walk over that sacrifice and then back over that same sacrifice. Now, here's what I want you to see quickly tonight, okay? Do you know how secure our salvation is in Christ? You see, two men that decided on a contract together, he could lie to me. He could cheat me. But we have a God that cannot lie. And before the foundations of the world, God the Father and God the Son agreed that the sacrifice of God the Son in human flesh 
would be a sacrifice acceptable to pay the sin debt of the whole world, and that agreement was sealed by the Holy Spirit. And as they walk over the very bloodshed of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is sealed for us, the witness of God is greater. What God has done in, thank you. What God has done in the portals of heaven that you and I can never see is greater than the witness of men. Those three, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, agreeing in one before Adam ever took a breath, before there was sun, moon, and stars, before there was land and sea and all that in them is, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit completely as one agreed that Jesus Christ would be the sacrifice for man's sin debt. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of, son, of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Listen, we like to trust in what we can see. We like to be able to say things like, I've heard preachers say, I've traveled to Israel. I've seen the empty tomb. I may never be in that part of the world. I'm okay with that. I've heard men say things like, I've seen the garden tomb. That's what we believe. They, they believe where Jesus was buried. My fleshly eyes may never see it. There are fleshly eyes that have that have recorded and reported these things for us. And we have the witness of men through the, through the, the recording of God's word. But the Bible says the witness of God is greater. These three events in the life of Christ and these three that agree in one and these three, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit that are one are the picture of our complete and satisfied salvation. I am not just saved. I don't just have to know that I'm saved by what I see. I can know that I'm saved by the witness of men and by the witness of God. Listen, I, I love children. Children, I love the sincerity and the simplicity of children. Years ago, years ago in our first location, I, I had sat down with a nine-year-old little boy in the back of the auditorium, some other kids singing and doing things. And I went through the plan of salvation with him, went through the Romans road, all the verses, explaining things to him. Hey, you're a little sinner. I didn't say it exactly like that, but he knew what I meant. Do you believe you're a sinner? And I remember this little kid, he looked at me and goes, oh, yeah, I do bad things. He just knew it. Yeah, I do bad things. I said, you know what a sin is? He goes, I hit my little sister in the head yesterday for no reason. Yeah, that's a bad thing. You know, sin must be paid for. He goes, yeah, I had to go to my room. Well, that may have paid for you hitting your sister in the head, but there are sins that are bigger and greater, and that one enough is enough to send you to hell. And I didn't say it that way to him. And I walked him all the way through, and I asked him, would you like to ask Jesus to be your Savior today and forgive your sins? He said, yeah. And he looked at me, and he goes, who wouldn't? Well, that's an excellent question. When you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And we sat for a few more minutes and I said, I turned to this verse. And I read this verse to him and he said, I don't get it. Because I read that verse to him. Honestly, I had almost been taught before, just read this verse. It'll give people confidence in their salvation. I read this to a nine-year-old boy and he goes, I don't get it. I said, well, let me ask you this. If you died today, what would happen to you? He said, I'd go to heaven. I said, because you're a good little boy? He goes, nope. Because God's a good, great, big God. Yeah, he's right. Not because he's a good little boy, but because God's a great, big old God. And I said, well, what makes you so sure you're going to heaven? And here's what he said. He said, because I don't think you drove me all the way here in an old beat-up van to this dungeon place to lie to me. And I don't think God wrote all that to try to lie to me either. Fair enough. The witness of man is something. 
but the witness of God is greater. And God says, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And God was satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ, and I am secure in him. Thank the Lord for it, right? Let's pray together tonight. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, I pray that tonight, that things that I have studied and found that have prepared this week from your word that have been able to be relayed to folks in such a way that it's helpful to them. Lord, I pray you'd help us to have a, have a, a greater appetite for your word and, and for what you, we can find in it about thee. Lord, I pray you'd help us tonight. I pray you'd help us as we share our burdens and requests one with another. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be sincere and faithful in our prayer times with thee. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anybody with any new requests tonight you'd like to turn in? If so, fellas, help me gather those. Get them in the back here. While those are headed this way, I uh, have a couple to just remind you of out of the bulletin. Um, under cancer on the left side of the bulletin, Justin Napier is uh, the bottom name on the left column there. Uh, please continue to pray for him. How many of you uh, see the updates in the Facebook private members group? One of those came out on Monday, I think, Monday or yesterday. If you haven't seen that, go, go check that out. Um, Ms. Teresa gave an update on some things that, that he's dealing with uh, right now. And so please, please continue to pray for him. Pray for the Napier family as a whole, but pray for Justin. Uh, God will touch his body. Uh, also, I appreciate that update, Adam. I had your dad's name circled. Um, Adam's dad, Charles, had surgery on Monday, and uh, that went well. He may not get to go home until, may get to go home on Friday or Saturday. We just keep praying for his recovery, and uh, ended up with five bypasses. And uh, that, that's a major surgery. And uh, I was just talking to Adam for the service, and he said yesterday the doctor said he's doing well. And with that, and so grateful for that, grateful to hear that, I've been praying for him, and uh, so thank you for that update, we appreciate that very much. Mrs. Patterson is asking us to pray uh, for her uncle, Glenn Cooper Ryder, um, he has heart issues in the hospital, he's in the hospital with heart issues, but also, uh, let's be praying for his salvation, and um, yeah, that's Glenn Cooper Ryder. Um, I just got a message from Luke Benner just before the service. He's been sick for almost a week and uh, said he's starting to feel better, but please uh, pray for him to continue to recover and feel better. Uh, again, pray for Brother Moreland, and uh, I know he'd appreciate your prayers uh, just trying to get healed up from falling uh, over those forklift forks uh, earlier today at work, and so please continue to pray for him. Thanks for praying for my mother-in-law. Time is, is back and forth in my head. Uh, about all that's been going on and she's had hip replacement surgery checkup today was good right and so she's walking and um, yeah able to get up and around to do things and so but please continue to pray for her recovery and uh, uh, <laughs> when it, I don't know it'll be it won't be too long they'll be able to travel and you'll get to see her soon right and uh, I gotta talk to her doctor and uh, tell her that it's easier to walk than to ride riding should be like a 52 week recovery right I'm joking. I know they're watching. If they're not watching live, they'll be on in a minute. I'm in big trouble. And uh, my phone's probably already ringing. And uh, a few weeks ago, I said something about my father-in-law. My phone was ringing before the church service ended. And uh, I'm thinking, man, you, you're watching live. I'm still in front of people. You were calling my phone. And so we keep praying for Debbie. I know she's great. We appreciate that. And uh, but she's recovering well. And I'm uh, very, very grateful for that. So, all right. Let's go ahead and pray together for these things tonight. Lord, we thank you again for your goodness to us. Lord, we thank you for the good report uh, from Adam's father's surgery on Monday. Lord, we pray you'd help him in his recovery. Lord, help him to, uh, Lord, follow the things he's supposed to do in the hospital, all the recovery, uh, walking, and, and therapy, and all that goes with it. Lord, we pray that, uh, Lord, he would do what's necessary to be able to get healthy and get home. And, uh, Lord, we just pray you'd help Adam's mom and, and those that are uh, back and forth from, from Cincinnati day by day. Give them safety. And, Lord, give them strength and uh, endurance for, for these days. And uh, Lord, we pray you'd continue to touch their family as a whole. Lord, we think of Glenn Cooper Ryder. Pray you'd touch him physically as he's having the hospital, as he's in the hospital with heart issues. But uh, Lord, we pray more so that, Lord, that uh, the gospel could be presented to him, that he would have an opportunity to trust Christ 
as his Savior. Lord, we think of Justin Napier tonight. Pray to touch his body. Lord, give doctors and surgeons and all that, that need it, wisdom and guidance there. Lord, touch their family. Lord, provide a special measure of grace, their direction. Lord, help Luke Benner to keep getting well. Lord, we pray you help him uh, to get back to full strength. Lord, help Brother Moreland tonight to heal up. And he's uh, just stoved up. You know all that's going on there, Lord. We pray you help him get him strength. Lord, we thank you for Debbie's successful uh, hip replacement surgery. We do pray, uh, Lord, you continue to give her strength day by day. And uh, God, we just thank you for your goodness to us. Pray you'd continue to guide us, give us safety tonight as we depart from here in just a few minutes. And we ask all this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Very good. Just a couple things really quickly, and uh, we'll dismiss in just a moment. Um, tonight's cantata practice will be for ladies. Ladies that need to practice, uh, that'd be good. I'm not saying you need more practice than the guys. That's not what's being inferred. Um, but if ladies can just gather up this direction and uh, around the piano in just a few minutes, uh, you'll be able to work on some things, be able to get questions, you'll be able to work through those. Um, but if everybody could take just a minute tonight, and help with a small project. If you could help us collect all the songbooks and Bibles and blankets and footstools and um, all those kind of things and bring them forward. We're going to set all that stuff on the platform. Um, how many of you know we were praying about chairs to replace the pews? And uh, some of the funds needed for those chairs came in Sunday morning. And uh, a little bit more of that came in Sunday night. And then... Uh, God pricked somebody's heart specifically that provided the remainder of the funds needed to buy chairs. And so, Lord willing, those are coming Friday, and these are going tomorrow uh, somewhere else. And so someone will be here at 9 o'clock in the morning uh, to look at pews, come in with cash in hand, pray that God gives them safety, and pray that they bring five or six good strong men with them. That would be fantastic. The less I have to touch, the better. And uh, so but once all the songbooks and, and Bibles and listen, honestly, uh, look at all the hymn book holders in front of you. If there's a piece of garbage, let's go ahead and take that out. Shouldn't be there in the first place. But if there is, let's go ahead and take that out. Get all the garbage thrown away. We don't want to give away or sell garbage with pews. And, but just make sure there's nothing in them. And if you're an able-bodied guy, uh, Brother Forty's grabbing some tools. We're going to take a couple, three of these pews loose tonight uh, just to begin the process of seeing what difficulty level we're going to be dealing with in taking those up and so he's already got the back door open and headed this way in a moment with some tools and I think this is going to start right up this way so um, I, I told Miss Kirsten tonight I just didn't feel right about standing there waving my arm while other guys are pulling pews and, and so if ladies would like to work I'm, I'm all for that on, um, uh, on working on the cantata that'd be great and we do need the work that's for sure uh, but we're going to start the process of just song books in one pile up this way and uh, if we could do this, it's just a personal preference. The pew Bibles that we collect, let's not lay those on the floor, even on the platform. And uh, if we need to put those up here on chairs or on the piano bench, uh, the Bibles that are here, just don't put those on the floor. I'd greatly appreciate that. Yeah, you might be able to stack them on the communion table, put the Bibles on, on something other than the floor. I'd appreciate that very, very much. Any questions about all that? Songbooks, we can stack those on the floor all you want. Right. All right. Very good. Appreciate your help. You're dismissed.